Hi guys, today I'm joined by Colonel Terry Verts, who is a retired U.S. Air Force test pilot, a NASA veteran, former International Space Station commander. He is also a speaker, photographer, filmmaker. He has his bachelor's degree in science and mathematics and his aeronautical science degree in aeronautics. Welcome. It's good to be here. Nice to, nice to see you, Christian. Thank you. So, Colonel Verts, what are your degrees and expertise in? Um, I am uh, an Air Force Academy graduate. So when I was there, I got a degree in math, applied mathematics, which is sort of like engineering. It's like mostly math with some engineering. And then I also got a minor in French. And so those are my two uh, degrees I got when I went to college. And then I went to Embry-Riddle and got a master's degree, like you said. And I also went to Harvard Business School and I spent a semester there uh, learning business. So that's my education. And what got you through all the accomplishments? Was it like a work ethic, a passion, or anything else? I think it was passion. I think that's exactly right. Because when I was a kid, <coughs> um, the first book I read was about Apollo. I really got excited about space. And I grew up with pictures of airplanes and galaxies and all that on my, on my walls, you know, when I was, when I was a kid. And I just loved it. And that's what I wanted to do. So I have this like burning desire, this really strong ambition to become a pilot and eventually astronaut. So that's what got me going. It's what motivated me to do all the work because there is a lot of work, like you said. Just one second. All right. Yeah. So that I think it was mostly that. And what differed you from a child, like a child's fantasy of becoming an astronaut versus right. someone who really put their whole life into it? You know what it was, I think? I have this message I tell kids, and that is don't tell yourself no. You know, if there's some dream you have, if there's a desire you have, everybody's been given gifts and talents and abilities. So once you figure out what yours are, don't say, oh, I can never do that. Oh, I'll never, you know, other people do that, but not me. I didn't, I wasn't born in the right place or whatever. I wasn't born in the right place. I wasn't born into a family of astronauts. I was the first person to go to college. Um, I just was crazy enough to think I could do it. And I did, you know, I went to the academy and became a pilot, a fighter pilot. And um, that, that idea of don't telling yourself, don't tell yourself no is super important. Whatever your dream is, you have to pursue it. And the bigger the dream you have, the harder the work. It's not easy to be a doctor or start a company or be an astronaut. Those are not easy things. Um, but unless you try and do it, um, you're not being true to yourself. Well, thank you for that, Colonel Verts. And going back further, what was your experience in the Air Force? And um, what was your role during the time? Right. So I started off at the Air Force Academy. <coughs> While I was there, um, academics were a big part of it, but also flying. I became a glider instructor. So I taught other cadets how to fly gliders. And I loved that. That was so much fun. Um, and then when I graduated, I went on to be an F-16 pilot and eventually a test pilot. So I flew F-16s around the world in Florida and Georgia and Arizona and Korea and Germany and Turkey um, and a lot of different places. And then I went, I was supposed to go to France for test pilot school and the Pentagon messed up some paperwork. Um, so I ended up going to Edwards Air Force Base in California to do my test pilot school. What was the main purposes of all of those flights? So as an F-16 pilot, that's a, that's a fighter pilot. You know, my job was to fight in war. Um, I did all the different missions. I did, you know, normal bomb dropping mission. I did an air to air, air defense kind of mission. Um, I did something called suppression of enemy air defenses or wild weasel where we would go look for enemy radars and try and take out their surface to air missiles before they could shoot us down. Um, I even did nukes. So nuclear weapons was part of our, uh, my job when I was in Germany, <coughs> excuse me. And so um, I kind of did everything in the F-16. Are there some new technologies that you've seen being implemented? Well, the biggest technology change in the last 20 years has been drones. You know, now, Drones are part of the military and civilian life. Um, they're still airplanes. You know, they still do the same thing that airplanes do. 
they can just fly for longer or they can fly in more dangerous places. And if they get shot down, we're not as sad. You know, if, if I got shot down, some people would be sad. If a drone gets shot down, you know, it's yeah. not as bad. So that probably advent of drones has, has been a big change, uh, which is kind of scary because now we have these robots that can do our fighting. And there's a lot of ethical and moral problems with that. So we really need to be careful going forward. For the people that would have your job as a fighter pilot nowadays, uh, would they be an important role now, like an extremely key role, or would they be more of strategic? No, the, there are still fighter pilots. There's still F-16 pilots. There's F-35 pilots. There's F-22 pilots. And so there's still people that fly these jets and over enemy territory and so on. Um, so hopefully we we will stop having so many wars and not have as many wars in the future, but you still need to be prepared just in case. And so we're still going to have um, pilots. It'll just be more of a mix between people and drones versus when I did it, it was 100% people. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me the difference of flying in space versus flying within the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. I wrote a chapter about that. I got my new book, How to Astronaut. You're going to talk about that, right? That's great. Yeah. Yeah. The, the cool ahead. book. So there's a chapter about that because when you fly in the air, the way you move the airplane, you have these control surfaces that go up and down and they pitch and roll and yaw the airplane. But in space, there's no air. And so you have to fire rockets. And um, if you want to climb, you have to speed up and then that climbs you. But it, and then that slows you down. But if you want to go faster, you have to descend and that'll speed you up. And so the ways you maneuver are completely different than the way you maneuver in airplanes. So it takes time as a pilot to retrain your brain how, how you fly in space. Um, and that was one of the coolest parts. When I flew the space shuttle, it was manual. I got to fly it. I mean, I literally took the controls and flew the space shuttle. I undocked it from the station and flew it around the station. Um, but the new capsules, the Boeing and SpaceX human capsules are completely automated. So the astronauts don't have anything to do. They literally just, they, they monitor, they watch the computer screen and the capsule does everything. And do you find that um, better or for the worse? Like, because right. people aren't actually flying it manually now. Well, it's not as much fun. I mean, I'm a pilot, so I'd rather, personally, I'd rather fly the thing, um, but, you know, it, it is what it is. It's the world we're in, and there's, there's less human control of stuff. You know, soon cars are going to be self-driving, um, which will be a big change for sure. I think it'll be better, especially once we get to the point where it's safe. But because um, uh, it would be nice that, you know, if you got an hour drive, you could read a book or watch TV or get your work done rather than having to drive the whole time. Mm -hmm. And... In the area of flight overall, whether it's um, flying an airplane or flying a shuttle, do you think that it's going to hurt us if we actually did need pilots in the future? Well, that is probably not as plausible because people would probably have found out ways to have it fully automated. But do you think it might be bad to some extent that it's like a lost, lost art or skill that people learn? Well, for now, people are still flying, so it's not a lost art yet. But I could see a time in the future, <coughs> say 100 years from now or 200 years from now, when people are like, remember back when we used to drive cars or fly airplanes? You know, there's going to come a point when that doesn't, that'll be a rare thing versus now it's the common thing. But I think that's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And in the future, would you want to stop that and to keep people from forgetting it? I think there should always be, um, you know, human flown airplanes. So there should always be, you know, some manual, uh, manual flying, <coughs> excuse me, I have this cough. Um, so I, I think we should keep that. Yes. Yeah, I agree because nothing can really replicate a hundred percent of humanity, whether there right. are some advantages of having it automated. I agree with you. And moving on, what were some of your responsibilities as the commander of the ISS? So I um, was basically the person in charge and responsible. So if anything went wrong, ultimately it would be my fault. Although um, I had 
great crew. All my astronauts were very experienced on my crew. And I had all of the different uh, mission control centers around the world um, making sure that things were going well. So there's lots of help. And, and the commander doesn't have that much to do. You know, it's not like you have to think of everything on your own. You've got a whole team of folks that are planning your days for you and planning what's happening in the future. Um, when, when it is really important is during emergencies or if something suddenly happens, then, you know, the crew has to take charge and not depend on the ground to do that for them. And overall for your specific, um, time in space, was there a broader like mission that you guys are supposed to accomplish? Well, the mission of the space station is science. So when I was there for my 200 day mission on the ISS, our job was to do science. We had 250 science experiments. But when I was on the space shuttle, when I was a shuttle pilot, our mission was to finish the assembly. So it took over 10 years to build the space station. It took a long time. Um, and we brought up the last parts, Node 3 and Cupola. And so our job was to install these two modules, a living module called Node 3, and then this seven-windowed observational module called the Cupola. And... When you guys were doing the science experiments, was it more like astronomy and um, examining different parts of a galaxy, or was it more like the effect, the effects of being in space? Everything. We did both of those actually. Lots and lots of experiments on my body. Um, the ISS has this big, giant, like bigger than a refrigerator machine called AMS. It's a particle detector, and it's looking for um, antimatter, basically anti-helium particles and some other particles that come flying in from the galaxy. And as it detects these, it can, it can figure out if there's dark matter or not. So there's this stuff called dark matter um, that we think is filling the universe. We think like 90% of the universe is dark matter. And, um, but we don't really know what it is or how much of it is or whatever. So we're using AMS to detect that. Uh, a lot of medical experiments, some combustion experiments, material science, tr testing out different materials. So basically anything you can study in college, there's probably one or 10 or 20 experiments on the ISS. Mm -hmm. And moving on to more of your current situation right now, mm -hmm. can you explain more about your book and film and how they might be related? Yes. So How to Astronaut is a book I just wrote. It just came out a few weeks ago. And it is about space travel. It's every, everything you need to know before leaving Earth. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you'd expect, like how do you do emergencies on the space shuttle? How do you build a space station? How do you fly jets? Um, how do you practice to be a medical doctor? And then there's some kind of crazy chapters that you might not expect, like uh, what do you do with a dead body if your crewmate dies? Or are there aliens? Or how do you time travel? Um, there's a chapter about a red button. There's a secret red button at the Kennedy Space Center. So I write about that. So the goal, my goal in writing that book was to make you laugh and say, wow. And they're all short chapters. There's 51 short chapters, just a few pages each. Um, but I wanted to bring space travel to everybody, you know, to old and young, to men and women. You know, it's not, this is not just for space nerds. This is for, I wrote it hopefully in a way that just anybody can read. Um, and then, like you said, I also did a movie called One More Orbit. And this movie was filmed last year. We took a jet. I've got a model of our airplane there, Gulfstream. And we flew it around the Earth. We went over the North Pole and South Pole. And it was, uh, it was an amazing experience. Initially, I was going to be a pilot. But by the time everything got arranged, it was too late for that. So I ended up being the director of the film. Um, so it was, uh, it was an amazing experience. And that's what I, I'm really trying to move into film and TV and do some projects like that. And um, it, was, uh, it was really cool. And that, that movie just came out last week. So it's just a brand new uh, thing. It's really, it's cool for me to go on iTunes or Amazon or IMDb and see um, One More Orbit directed by Terry Virts, which is pretty cool. Wow, that's, that's really um, interesting. Also, when you were like writing your book and it was getting some of the technical stuff or some of your memories, did you have to dig deep or were they just on top of your mind because it was such um, an important experience for you? 
You know, most of this stuff just flowed. <clears throat> um, my first book was a National Geographic photography book called View From Above. Um, and I wrote that in two weeks. I would wake up, set my alarm. By 8 a.m., I was at my desk typing. And I would write until my brain was full. Uh, usually by lunchtime, I was done for the day. And then I would go have lunch and come back again tomorrow and do it. And after two weeks, I had the whole book written. When I wrote... Uh, how to astronaut. I was in the middle of training. I was in the middle of filming one more orbit. I was traveling constantly. So I was, you know, on airplanes every week or several times a week. So I wrote a lot of this book on an airplane. Like I would go sit down on United Airlines, get my laptop out and write a chapter. Um, and that was how I mostly wrote this book. And now I'm writing a new book. I've got a kid's book coming out. It'll probably be like elementary school age. Um, but it'll be at like a hundred questions, ask an astronaut a hundred questions. Um, so that's going to be pretty cool. So I'm just starting to write that now. So that'll be my, my third real book that I've written. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. It was great to be here. Um, today I was joined by Colonel Terry Vert, who is a retired United States Air Force test pilot, a NASA veteran, and the former ISS commander. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great job, and it was good to be here. I hope everybody enjoys it. All right.